Nashua El Sayed was kidnapped by her father when she was only two and a half years old and spent 17 years in Egypt. Her story and extraordinary escape make her one very inspiring activist. I was born here in New York in, in, in September 1990 to an Egyptian father and a Puerto Rican mother. Uh, two and a half years after I was born, there was a divorce, which included my father kidnapping me from the United States to Egypt. The FBI located Nashua, but because of differing laws on child custody between the two countries, Nashua could not be rescued. He had threatened her that if she would come and take me or visit me, that he would do something to her. And of course, she was very terrified of that. Her father told her that her mother was dead, and she spent the next 17 years in Egypt. She describes this time as physically and psychologically abusive. Everything had a punishment, everything was a mistake, so I lived my life just trying to go through the day without making him angry. Nashua's father eventually agreed to a visit from her mother after being convinced by a family friend. Nashua was nine years old. I asked my dad, you know, who's this? And he said, this is your mother. And, w and without like, you know, questioning or, or doubting, I just, I ran into her arms and like, I knew it was her. You know, even though I couldn't speak the language and she couldn't speak mine, but it seemed like we talked for hours. And um, it was just the most exciting thing because that was it. Like, that was, you know, the hope that I needed, that my abusive life is not all I have. There's more out there, so. I taught myself English, and, uh, like, I began to, to speak to her and to learn about my culture. And she told me that I was American and I'm not just Egyptian, that I come from a place where I have options. I have the option to study what I want, be whom I want. I am powerful because I'm a woman. I don't have to be abused. I don't have to be forced into marriage. In my last year of, of high school, my father came into my room and told me that he had found me a husband and that I would be married that summer after graduation. Nashua's mother reached out to the FBI and informed them that her daughter was considering suicide rather than being forced into an arranged marriage. The FBI came up with a plan to rescue her. So at five in the morning, I prayed and I put on my shoes, my t-shirt, my jeans and my hijab and I ran outside of the door. And the van came and they slowed down. They took me in and they kept driving. Nashua enrolled in Queens College and later received a full fencing scholarship. While in school, she also established the Kitab Club, an after-school language program for immigrant children. And she founded the Syria Project, a program aimed at helping recent Syrian refugees integrate into the community. While majoring in international politics, she met Professor Mark Rosenblum, a renowned Middle East expert who became her mentor. I knew that this was not just a special biography, not just a riveting narrative. It was a life that was maybe once or twice in a lifetime. You'll meet a person with this experience with a tenacity of overcoming. He became the father that I've never had. He is always the one that I, that I turn to in terms of advice. When I was 13, I told my dad, I want to study political science. I think this is my niche. His answer was, politics is for men. After majoring in international politics, Nasha became a student activist for the Ibrahim Leadership and Dialogue Project. This is a program that a Muslim American businessman and his son started after 9-11 when they lost some loved ones and most importantly felt their religion, Islam, had been hijacked, then their statement was bringing in the best and brightest young student scholars of interfaith America to be ambassadors of the United States. 
We went to Washington for two days, then we went to Oman, to Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinian territories. I think the trip was a very intense, particularly intense experience for her. She felt like she was back in Egypt, and she, I think, found herself suddenly liberated. And we would meet, uh, you know, high officials, and we get to interact and ask questions. We all came out wanting to make a difference in this area and make a difference in our home as well to introduce the Middle East in like a different form that is not just guns and violence and conflict. There's also art, history, and the people themselves are very different than what we see in the media. What happens afterwards? Goodbye, see you later? No. They have to talk about the impact of the experience and have a sort of a contract with each other and with me and the Ibrahim family that they would continue their work in specific ways the year after. I want to form a for-profit company in the Middle East that would put back into the community by teaching women skills like leadership, organization, you know, how to start a nonprofit, how to tackle issues in your community. Nashua now works for the Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding. It gives me a way to show other students our power as youth. The center recently gave Nashua the award for uncommon courage. I'd say Nashua is on the way to being a very gifted advocate of her cause when it comes to abductions and trafficking of women in the Middle East on the cause of Israeli-Palestinian peace, on all of the things that she believes strongly in. She's wise beyond her age because she had choices to make, to stand still, to quit, or to bloom. And she's done the latter. A lot of people have approached me saying that my story has inspired, you know, change in them. And that's all that matters, honestly. And if I don't change a whole society, I might change one person. And, and for that, it's worth it.